everybody, today another Porsche centric video courtesy of my good friends George and Caitlin who run the Scotland North Division of the Porsche Club of Great Britain. And in this video I am asking should you ever buy a 911 convertible over a Boxster? Many times I have said no you should not and I've based that on all the Boxsters that I've driven. However, in truth I haven't really sampled that many 911 convertibles. So. Time to drive one and see if my theory still holds true. The car we have here today is a very late 2005 example of a 996 Carrera 4S. This is a perfect car for today's video for a number of reasons. First off, I am quite familiar with the coupe version of the Carrera 4S, so in theory I should be able to tell whether this car has suffered for being a convertible. The other reason is that I have quite a bit of experience with the 986 generation Boxster, which is the direct equivalent to this from the time. In fact, one of the reasons people didn't like the 996 generation 911 was because, particularly with the early cars, if you looked at one from the front, you couldn't really tell the difference between it and a Boxster. Because from about here onwards, a 911 and a Boxster were the same car. The specification of this particular car is, I think, very representative of the 996 C4S in general. So the exterior is seal grey, a colour that I think actually works really well with it, but I wished a few more people hadn't gone with. It has the six-speed manual gearbox, which here works very well indeed. They do vary quite significantly from car to car, but this one is in fine fettle. The action is very nice, the throw perhaps a touch longer than you might expect for a sports car but nothing really to worry about. This is a little lighter than some others I've experienced, a touch less notchy but no worse for it. It's a really beautiful gearbox. The interior is your very typical black leather with, for 996 generation typical, very very cheap feeling switch gear. The infotainment here has been upgraded with a later modern doubled in head unit which gives you Bluetooth functionality, more modern nav and all that sort of stuff and you see that quite a bit. James has retained the original head unit because if he sells the car, something he may do soon, a lot of people tend to want them. The only real mechanical change made to this car is with the exhaust where the original item has been replaced with a stainless steel one because it simply rusted through. This is a very common thing to do with these cars, upgrading the exhaust I would say is well worth doing, particularly if yours is already falling apart. And if you've got a car with an original exhaust on it and you haven't checked it over, please do. They are notorious for just breaking up. Where it sits in the back it gets heated and cooled to some extreme and does get all sorts of crud, salt and water thrown at it fairly frequently. So um, given the fact it's made out of steel, not really a surprise that it falls apart. The 996 is typically seen as one of the least desirable of Porsches and certainly the least desirable of 911s. Reasons for that including the styling, particularly the headlights that were and remain very controversial, the fact it shared so many parts with the Boxster that the um, price difference was in some ways a little bit difficult to justify and the fact the interior is rather low rent. However, as time has progressed, I've developed something of a soft spot for the 996 and it seems many others have too. Today, if you drive one of these, what you'll find is yes, a car with a low rent interior, but also one that feels considerably more old school than many would have you believe. As far as I'm concerned, the way this feels, goes and drives is actually much closer in spirit to the 993 than it is, say, the 991 and certainly the 992. These also developed a reputation for being rather unreliable, chiefly because of the engine. As it happens, this near last of line 2005 example has an IMS bearing from a 997, so that appears to be an issue that shouldn't be a concern here. One thing I would say really in general to anybody considering a 996 is if you're buying into them thinking it's going to be a very cheap, easy thing to own and maintain, uh, do think twice about that. The fact is, even this, the most youthful of all 996s, is now 17 years old, with earlier examples closer to 25. 
they were when new expensive cars granted not as expensive as a ferrari but in truth the running costs of one of these and say a 360 aren't as different as many owners would like to think my 996C4S had £11,000 spent on it by the owner before me, and it still had issues. This one has had about £5,000 lavished on it over the last two years, and that's a combination of both repair and regular maintenance. It's had a full set of tyres on it. The only real problem James has encountered was a cracked coolant reservoir, which did take a little bit of panic to sort, but was sorted and luckily wasn't too expensive. So then, that's enough nattering about the car, what does a 996 C4S convertible actually drive like? a sheer delight. You can tell this car has been really well cared for. Creaks and rattles are almost zero. It turns in beautifully. The steering is wonderful, communicative, weights up exactly when it should, but it is light the rest of the time. Very typical 911. There is scuttle shake, you can sense it, but it doesn't seem like there's enough to really cause that much concern. I'm about to encounter a very well-known piece of road where two bits of tarmac don't quite meet eye to eye, and if there's any issues with this chassis, we'll find out now. Turn in, drop down, did tap the ground there. I've driven many, many a sportier car than this through there and not had a problem. But this has that little lip on the front I see many 996s get, and um, they can be quite tricky. You wouldn't really think it with the 911 supposed to be the practical sports car, but uh, put one of those lips on the front and car parks and the like can be tricky in these. The C4S, particularly this 996 generation, has always been a car that kind of splits people down the middle. Some love it for the way that it looks. It's got essentially turbo styling, the wider body, missing the air intakes, but still has that big aggressive stance. However, others point out that it has no more power to make up for the fact it is larger, slightly less aerodynamic and heavier, meaning what you're getting is a performance penalty for the fact that it looks quite nice. And that to many is completely the antithesis of a sports car. I kind of get that argument, but it does look quite good. This convertible version, I will confess, loses a little bit of that aggression and definition that the coupe has. This really is one of the reasons I've never been that big a fan of 911 convertibles. They just don't really look right. I would say in the 992 generation, they've actually managed to crack that, and with the roof up, the car does now look pretty decent. Unfortunately, the 992 has many other issues I've talked about in many of my videos. This with the roof up, it looks okay, and roof down, it does look just a, a little bit weird. 911s have an iconic look about them. There's that particular shape. In the same way that you can draw a Lamborghini with one line, so should you be able to do it with a 911. You know, you draw that top outline and anyone, even your casual car spotter, would say that is a 911. With the convertible, I've kind of ruined it. Though the engines in these do attract much criticism, sometimes rightly so, I've actually always been rather fond of it. At low RPM it has a sort of animalistic growl and it's got a really strong mid-range too. This at 3 to 4,000 RPM is a very, very punchy unit. The C4S, as you might imagine, being the widest version of the car with the all-wheel drive system, has always been one of the heaviest. The convertible, of course, has added even more kilos, so in terms of dynamics and speed, this is the least impressive of all the 911s. The only car which I think could upset a 911 purist more would be the Targa, which in this generation had a very big, impressive panoramic sliding glass roof that I quite like, but is notoriously fickle. That engine really does respond beautifully. One of the issues I found with 996 is the throttle response feels fantastic until you realise that what it's doing is giving you everything in that first tiny bit of throttle movement. So you go to ask more from it and um, there isn't any. It's a shame. 
feels like sport mode is engaged permanently when the car actually doesn't have one. The upside though is it does make heel and toe very easy and very enjoyable. Ride quality in this car is absolutely superb. As far as I'm aware, it's on the regular suspension. It's certainly riding on the original wheels, which do suit the car very well. Although they do my nut because they go different directions on each side of the car. And I have to say, it is coping with this Scottish tarmac very, very well. Any car that has a rattle, a creak, a squeak, a suspension that's a little bit too firm, this road will find it. And I haven't encountered that yet. Another typical Porsche problem is certainly present here. The gears are just a little bit too long. Second, if you rev it out, will get you to the national speed limit on this road, which is a great shame because the gearbox is fabulous. And with the extra weight this car is carrying, I feel like some shorter gears wouldn't go amiss. Oh, that's lovely. The turning in this is so good. Here's one of the other things about the 996 now. Because it is so old, Talking about the difference between certain models is almost, almost irrelevant. The fact is, it's more important how well a car's been cared for, what's been done to it, and how well it's been maintained. Have the bushes been replaced? Has the suspension been sorted out? Has someone put some silly aftermarket stuff on that seemed like a good idea, but actually ruined it? Blisteringly quick? It is not. But fast enough? Yeah. I think it is. So then, to my original question, when you can buy a Boxster that is, to many, exactly the same as this, but a lot cheaper, is there any real reason to buy the 911? James, previous to this, had a Cayman, and like many, he felt to get the proper Porsche experience, he had to have a 911. I'm not sure he was actually searching for a convertible in particular, but this car came up, it was in a rather forlorn state, lived in central London, had lived outside, was a little bit neglected, and you can tell he's put quite a bit of effort into it. What remains is, I think, a really fine example of a classic Porsche, and to many that will always be exclusively the 911. He's previously had the 924, and I think for many, the Boxster will always be an equivalent to that. Simply the car people that can't afford a 911 buy. For me, in a straight fight, the Boxster is still victorious. Yes, this is a little bit quicker, but that much quicker than a late Boxster S? Probably not. The truth is, neither of them are going to set your hair on fire, and if you really want the quickest car, you should be buying the one with the roof on anyway. Scuttle shake isn't quite as bad in here as I had thought, though it is certainly present. It doesn't really seem to bother the car in any way, shape or form. That to me is the most important thing. I'm certainly not upset by it. In fairness, I don't think it's probably any worse than in the modern Ferrari F8. And this at least has an excuse of being very old. This car still drives very nicely, and I would say, though it's not quite as pure as your coupe, you can still tell the difference between the 911 and the Boxster. They do drive differently. I'm not going to say which is better, because each have their fans, but it is a difference. You will notice it. For your Top Trumps fan, of course, this will beat the Boxster. More power, better brakes, and they are good brakes in this, I do enjoy them. The pedal's always a little bit long and a little bit soft, but actually it means you just have to work it harder to get the best from it. And when the weather is a little bit against you, it does mean you can modulate them with absolute precision. Unfortunately, one of the 911's USPs over the Boxster or Cayman, the presence of back seats, is actually negated by the convertible. Wind noise and buffeting in here is actually really, really very good. There's hardly any of it. But that's likely because we've got this massive wind deflector behind us, which has also stolen the rear seats from you. And to be honest, you do want that in play. Without it there, I can imagine this wouldn't be particularly enjoyable. 
You also have only one boot in this car, which, because it's a four-wheel drive, is a little bit smaller than that you'll find in the Boxster, and the Boxster has space in the rear too. I suppose some would argue that instead of a boot, you get a view of the engine here, which you don't in the Boxster, but let's be honest, it's not an especially pretty engine, and you don't really see the engine itself anyway, you see all the stuff attached to the top of it, so that to me, I don't really care about. I'd rather the extra storage space. The Boxster, I think, is also the better looking car because it was designed from the ground up as a convertible. The first generation Boxster in particular, I have a real fondness for. I think it's a great piece of styling. I know it has its detractors, but I'm not one of them. Overall then, my opinion remains mostly unchanged. I would still have a Boxster over a convertible 911, but I have to be honest, this 996 C4S convertible has impressed me far more than I expected. It hasn't really lost too much of its 911-ness, and uh, you know what? On a beautiful day like today, this is a great car to be driving. So then, all that remains to be said is a big thank you to James for bringing this car out, to George and Caitlin for organising this review, and to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and even if you have, make sure you've hit the bell icon so you'll be notified of every new video that I release. See you for the next one. Bye-bye.